Praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, praise the Lord. We do thank you for joining us uh, for another Central Jersey Bible Institute Encouragement Series session. Uh, we do thank the Lord for paving the way, opening up the door as he has to, uh, to be able for us to be able to come together and break the bread of life uh, and the ultimate hopes of being able to come into a better knowledge of him. Uh, I'm hopeful for that very same thing, uh, to be able to walk away from uh, his table this evening feeling full, feeling fat in the spirit. Amen. Uh, looking more and more like uh, what he has envisioned for us to be. Uh, before we uh, get started with the, uh, the session tonight, let us do this right by approaching the Lord's great throne of grace, petitioning that he would bless us. Uh, amen. With his presence, his wisdom and his ways uh, this evening in Jesus name. I invite everybody to pray with me uh, in Jesus name. Let your heart pray. Uh, Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we love and thank you. We're asking, Lord, that you would have mercy upon us all as we are here, Lord, for no other reason but to come into a better knowledge of you. We thank you for giving us an opportunity to do so. We pray that you look upon us and be well pleased with this assembly, that you bless every household that's represented here and those that are here, those that are on their way, those that wanted to be here, couldn't. Ultimately, that you have blessed the church, Lord God, uh, to be able to reflect that which uh, is identified by the definition of church. So, Lord, we're asking that you would have mercy upon us and that by your grace, you would strengthen us to uh, receive the good that you have to give unto us and that you would rebuke the enemy from us, that we may be able to learn of you without distraction. And that ultimately, Lord God, as you, Lord, have honored our prayer request, that you would keep us rapture ready. But we love and thank you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen and amen. 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 Praise the Lord again unto you all uh, in Jesus name. Um, giving honor unto the Lord who is the head of my life. Uh, praise the Lord unto the pastor of the house, GRCC, uh, as well as the president of the Central Jersey Bible Institute and the person of Elder John Betts. Amen. To the uh, first lady of the house, uh, Lady Loria Betts, and uh, to the mother of the house and Mother Ida Harrell, to my wife, Sister Chantal Bonet, and from the board of the Central Jersey Bible Institute, we say praise the Lord unto you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, this evening is part two, uh, praise the Lord, uh, to last week's uh, lesson, which was uh, entitled The Increase of Love and the Mortification of Sin. So this is part two to that lesson. Um, and so last week we delved uh, pretty deep into uh, the uh, necessity and the reason uh, to mortify uh, sin. Uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And everybody is born into this world as a sinner. And if the Lord does not intervene uh, through that person's uh, walk in life, uh, eventually they will become uh, iniquitous or we're born in sin and shaping in iniquity. Uh, and so even that one verse tells a story in that uh, sin doesn't just sit in one spot and just lays idle and doesn't do anything. For if that was the case, then the verse would have to be remodified re to say that we're born in sin and stay sinners. But no, it says that we're born in sin and shaped into iniquity. When you look that word up, iniquity means wickedness. Um, so a person isn't born wicked. They eventually become wicked over time because of the callousness of the nature of sin around their heart and mind uh, that has uh, decayed and depraved them to the point where now they are, uh, you know, advanced sin, so to speak, stage four sin. Um, and that's what will happen to every last one of us if we uh, don't do something about it. Uh, this right here is a red alert. Um, and, you know, everybody should take heed to the importance of it. And one of the, um, the tricks of the enemy is to dilute the, uh, the necessity of, of, of trying to mortify sin. It's trying to, you know, uh, make sin not as important as it really is, but uh, it's it's very important to the point where even Jesus himself had to come down here to die on the cross, um, you know, in our stead uh, to give us a, an opportunity so that we will not uh, face him in judgment. Uh, so sin is very important and, you know, it behooves every last one of us to do what we can uh, to mortify uh, the sin. And as we discussed last week, the only way that we can really do that, praise the Lord, is uh, through uh, the efforts of Jesus Christ. Um, on our own accord, we cannot uh, mortify sin. We just don't have the capacity. We just don't have the strength. Even though, you know, people wake up every, uh, you know, uh, January 1st thinking that I got a new resolution, 
uh, and they believe in their heart that, you know, if I do X, Y, and Z, uh, this will make me a perfect person, uh, a better person. Um, but yet our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of the Lord. From the Lord's perspective, uh, if we would ask him, what should our resolution be? He would tell us, you need to mortify sin. You need to come to me and have your sins forgiven and then go and sin no more. Let a worse thing come upon you. Um, and uh, we know what that means, uh, as the scriptures have concluded that, you know, once the devil or the, rather the demons have been cast out of a person uh, to the point where they are now, uh, you know, uh, rid of them, uh, these demons go about uh, walking about and then they get it in their mind. Hey, let me go back and see how things are where I used to be. He comes back and see if he sees it swept and clean that he brings in seven others worse than himself. So, you know, mm -hmm. Jesus was absolutely right when he said, look, if you don't, uh, you know, if if you uh, don't remain uh, clean, you know, a worse thing is going to happen unto you. And so that's what we need to avoid. We do not want to revert backwards. We want to keep moving forward. And if you're going to walk behind uh, the hem of the garment of, of the man from Galilee, the person of Jesus Christ, this good shepherd, if you're going to walk behind him, it's a walk that means that you have to lighten the ballast. You have to uh, lighten the load. Uh, of whatever it was that you were burdened with in terms of sin uh, has to be taken off of you. And, you know, we have all, because we're born in sin and shape and iniquity, we've all gotten our clothes pretty dirty. And uh, I mentioned last week, praise the Lord, that um, uh, by looking at the uh, book of Zechariah, and how Joshua, the high priest, after the uh, Israelites were let free by the Persians from the captivity of Babylon, being held captive by Babylon, uh, Joshua was a high priest in Zechariah chapter 3. And as he faced the Lord and the devil was on his right side trying to hinder him and trying to hinder his work, right side meaning and uh, the power of, of, of anybody, um, you know, uh, so Satan was trying to influence everything that, he, that Joshua was trying to do. Uh, but yet one notable thing uh, that I wanted to mention from that scripture is that J Josh, uh, Joshua was in a, uh, he had uh, filthy clothes on. And, um, you know, as long as he stayed, you know, resolute and he was looking in the direction of the Lord, uh, praise the Lord. Then uh, the Lord finally said to Satan, leave him alone. Uh, this is a brand that I have plucked out of the fire. And Satan had to leave him alone. And immediately after uh, the Lord said this and Satan leaves, the Lord commands that Joshua has his clothes changed because he was filthy and uh, he was given clean clothes. Now, all of these things happened, you know, not because of something that Joshua uh, did outside of, you know, of, you know, showing faith unto the Lord. You know, Joshua couldn't go to the clothing store and buy those particular clothes that were pleasing in the sight of the Lord to put upon him. He couldn't do that. You know, because if he could, he would have. And, you know, I'm sure that that probably would have been, uh, you know, uh, some clothes that was, uh, you know, way out of his price range, something that he probably couldn't afford, you know. But if it was that easy, I'm sure he probably would have done everything he could to get it. But, you know, the uh, the this gift of clothing could only come from the Lord. And it can only come if we look at that particular instance, you know, and use that as a precedence. It can only come after the Lord has shown, has has seen that uh, a person loves him more than these, you know, and I'm sure Satan being on his right hand was trying to influence him, trying to tempt him, trying to pull him and sway him, convince him to look to the left and the right. But no, that man uh, stayed uh, steadfast and he continued to look forward, you know, unto the Lord uh, to show that he was, you know, uh, his hope lies in him. And that uh, once he did that, then the Lord said, okay, it is enough. I have seen enough. And so that's what this is all about. You know, uh, you know, we have an opportunity, praise the Lord, to have our sins mortified. And the only one that can do it, as in the illustration that we just spoke about with Joshua, uh, is the Lord God Almighty. He's the one that can change our filthy garments. You cannot go into heaven with filthy garments. You cannot go into heaven, you know, with garments that are stained. Uh, even if it appears as if it's clean, but yet if it has one stain, uh, that one blemish uh, is enough to keep a person out of heaven. Why? Because a little leaven, leaven if the whole lump. Uh, and so you can't have this, not even one thing uh, on your person that's offensive to God. It's got to go. Uh, and so, you know, uh, we ultimately need to have our garments changed. You know, uh, there's some of us walking about with 
uh, garments that are cleaner than others, you know, but it doesn't matter. As long as there is a spot on it, you're just as filthy as others. It doesn't matter. We need to be cleansed whole. And the only one that can do that is the Lord God Almighty. He provided the blood by which we can go under and have our sins uh, washed away. That is the only thing uh, that is in existence that could wash away a person's sins. And it is it is afforded unto anybody on this side of existence, you know, uh, and I say this side of existence because those who died in their sin uh, will remain in their sin and there's no blood available for them to have their sins washed away. And so, you know, this is the acceptable time. This is the acceptable day. Uh, once you hear, uh, praise the Lord, this is the acceptable time to come unto the Lord uh, because we don't know what tomorrow will bring unto us. None of us you know, has, uh, you know, um, none of us can definitively say that we have tomorrow or even the next minute or the next seconds, you know, guaranteed to any one of us. Not one of us can say that. We're on borrowed time. Even Jesus said that of his brethren, you know, when they asked if they should, you know, when they told him, well, why don't you go into Jerusalem? Jesus said, look, you know, my time is, your time is always ready. My time is not yet ready, you know. Um, and so what he was talking about was that uh, he was saying that, look, you can die at any time, you know, um, at any time and at any moment. Your time is always ready. The reason why you're still here is by God's grace, because Jesus Christ owns the keys of death and hell. And because he, uh, you know, is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into repentance and be saved. Especially if, if he sees in us, in anybody, uh, praise the Lord, a some semblance of hope, some semblance of life, you know, uh, you know, he will uh, cultivate that uh, individual uh, and prune uh, his leaves or her leaves, you know, to see if uh, this this stem can grow to become a mighty oak. And uh, if we can demonstrate that, then he will have patience with us to see if uh, it can grow some more. But we know, according to the scriptures, that, you know, his patience is not everlasting in this regard, you know, because there was a parable where the Lord was speaking about those who, uh, or rather, you know, the um, um, you know, the vineyard and be, the vineyard not being productive. And he said, why do you keep tilling the ground? Why do you keep doing this? You know, um, he said, let you know, just leave it a little, a little while longer. Let me just work on it some more. So we do know that uh, at some point in time, patience, you know, has uh, its boundary line uh, in this regard. And that, uh, you know, the Lord, after he sees uh, that something is unfruitful, will uh, then, uh, you know, uh, put an end to his working on it. And so, you know, uh, even John himself said, you know, the ax is laid at the root of the tree and he who, not, who does not bring forth fruit will be hewn down and cast into the fire. And so we cannot demonstrate unto the Lord ourselves in such a way. We cannot present ourselves in such a way. So therefore, uh, that then tells us that there's something that the church must do. And, you know, it, it's it's not just enough to be saved uh, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and know when your spiritual birthday is and all of this. That is not enough. There's something that we must do. And that thing that we must do is to have our sins mortified. And this will bring us into perfection. This will present us uh, as the bride of Christ who has used her time wisely as recorded in Proverbs 31, how she was diligent, the wife of, of the uh, the elder of the city, uh, the prodigal uh, 31 wife, who she didn't just sit at home, but she was productive, you know, uh, uh, you know, fulfilling the, um, uh, you know, the mission of, of her, her husband, the bridegroom. And so that's what the church is. We're out there fulfilling the mission of the bridegroom, for the Bible even says that she shall be saved through childbearing. In other words, she shall be saved through bringing in disciples unto Christ. And so we're not supposed to just sit around and do nothing. We have to be productive. And, you know, aside from trying to win souls, we have to make sure that our relationship with Christ is sound, you know, and, and why should you say that? Well, because for one, uh, when you look at the uh, 10 versions, the ones who were, uh, you know, considered foolish versions, uh, the Lord confessed that I never knew you. And so uh, those that were there for them mean that those who were the wise versions were those whom he knew. He's new. So the church has to do their part. The church has to um, individually speaking, you know, that means you, that means me, everybody who uh, is under the umbrella of the church 
has to make sure that we ensure that Jesus Christ knows us. And the only way that he will know us is if we do that, which he uh, considers um, uh, to be in accordance to his will. And the thing that is accordance to his will is to, uh, to mortify sin. Because ultimately, when he came down here, he came not just to rescue and save uh, us and the rest of those who will be saved, praise the Lord, the sons of God. But he also came to do away with the works of the devil. And so if the church, uh, praise the Lord, is to pick up the mantle that Christ has left as he goes to sit on the, on the right hand of the Father, he's left us an anointing like he like Elijah did for Elisha, so to speak. Uh, uh, you know, he left us his anointing so that we can do his will and we will do more just as Elisha was able to do more than Elijah did because he received a double portion of his spirit. So the Lord has kind of given us a double portion of his spirit when he says that you're going to do more than I did because I go unto the father. And so it therefore behooves all of us to pick up that mantle and to follow behind the mission of Jesus Christ. And the mission of Jesus Christ was not only just to save, uh, you know, those who will be deemed sons of God, which is what we are doing in the Great Commission by going out and telling the world and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, which is um, the name Lord Jesus Christ, but we are also to do away with the works of the devil. So he has uh, positioned us in a place on this spiritual battlefield where we face the gates of hell. And the Lord has anointed the church by saying uh, that the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. No, they will not. Uh, you know, so we are positioned against them. And even Paul uh, reveals and say, look, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against these things that you see, but rather we wrestle against principalities and powers and, you know, rulers of darkness and, and wickedness and, and high places, all of these things. These are the ones who we, uh, we fight against. And so if you're going to fight against them, you need to have on a particular anointed armor that will uh, allow you to uh, galvanize your, your, your heart and your mind against their forces. So ultimately we are fighting against evil. But then in fighting against evil, evil is not just on the outside, as we have seen, but evil is also on the inside. Because Paul said in himself, I feel something warring against the law of my mind. There's something here, even though I know that the objective is to fight against principalities and, and powers and, and rules of darkness and, and, and wicked and high places and all of these things. I know I fight them. And yes, I see them externally, but I feel something internally. I feel a, a character of them inside of me. I feel something warring against the law of my mind. It's trying to make me think otherwise. It's trying to, uh, you know, uh, distort my, my mental capacity. It's standing on my right side and it's trying to hinder my work, you know, uh, for Christ. And so, uh, you know, Paul then said, well, who shall, you know, deliver me from the body of this death? You know, so inside of us, we have that which um, um, uh, resembles, in a sense, the gates of hell, you know, uh, not to say that that's what it is, uh, literally, but it does take on, a, it does take on uh, the same type of characteristics, it lusts, um, it, it, it desires uh, wickedness, uh, all of these things it wants to do, let's see here, according, uh, praise the Lord, to um, I want to read the scripture to you according to Galatians chapter five, verse 19. These are the works of the flesh. Uh, and they are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So that which is inside of me that is warring against the law of my mind, that mind that I received when I received the gift of the Holy Ghost, uh, praise the Lord, that that mind of Christ that has now been put inside of me, that, that soft heart, that heart of a flesh where the law has now been inscribed upon, you know, there's something inside of me warring against that. So if I am going to use tenacity, if I'm going to galvanize myself against those on the outside, the gates of hell, 
that means I have to still galvanize myself against that which is on the inside that takes on the same type of attributes, you know, because when you're talking about these lusts of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, if that's the flesh and that's a part of me, then I know that that's also what I find over there on the side of the gates of hell. And so I have to use the same, you know, the, the, the same, um, you know, energy uh, to be able to fight against my flesh. And I'm not talking about what I touch my flesh. No, I'm talking about the nature of the flesh. That's what I'm fighting up against. And how can you do that? How can you do that on your own? Paul says, this is the body of death, you know, who shall deliver me from it? Because uh, it, it has such a stronghold and we're fighting a very formidable foe, uh, somebody who can really take you down. This is not this is not a walk in the park. When you step in the ring uh, with uh, these type of uh, spirits, uh, praise the Lord, um, you know, you better make sure that you uh, have done your training. Uh, you better make sure that you, uh, you know, have uh, prepared yourself for this particular battle. Uh, Paul says you got to put on the armor of God, not just a portion of the armor, but you got to put on the full armor because he understood that you're fighting up against these wicked forces who uh, who are in, who are highly skilled at murder. We're not just talking about killing and, and maiming and taking from you. No, we know the Bible says of the devil that he comes to steal, kill but he also says that he comes to destroy. Now, he doesn't have the capacity to destroy. He doesn't do that. Jesus says that uh, don't fear him who can kill the body. And that's all he can do. Um, and he wasn't talking about Satan in, in, uh, in this latter part. He says, but rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Satan can't do that. He can't take somebody and throw them into hell. He doesn't have the keys of death and hell. Only Jesus has that. So Jesus is saying, fear the Lord, you know? Uh, and if you do, that is the beginning of wisdom. Now I'm starting to see, now I'm starting to understand that if I listen to the Lord, that if I respect him, that if I revere him, uh, you know, knowing that he's not like the devil at all, the Bible says, Jesus says of him that he was a murderer from the beginning, you know, he is literally the antichrist spirit. No, uh, we're talking about opposite of antichrist, which is Christ, and he's not a murderer. No, he's a God of love. And if I take heed to him, him who has all the power, yet he is still God of love, then I know that in the end, I will be able to stand on him singing a song of deliverance like the song of Moses when he crossed the Red Sea. So any type of mortification of sin I can't do for myself. I can't. I, I don't have the power to do for myself. I, I, can't, I can't erase the wrong that I've done. I can't. God still sees it. Sin has the capacity to uh, not just get on your person like your clothes received a stain or something like that. No, this stains your soul is what it does. It goes deep in the, it permeates inside of you and becomes one with you. It becomes one with your soul. It darkens your mind and your thoughts. That's what these things do. Uh, remember what happened to Adam and Eve after they had uh, sinned against the Lord by taking the forbidden fruit off the tree. Uh, the knowledge of good and evil, praise the Lord. It darkened their mind. They no longer saw God the way that they should have seen him. They, they saw things from a very distorted perspective. Now they truly were behind a glass darkly and they just couldn't make out what was on the other side. They, they attempted to become self-righteous by you know, uh, creating a fig leaves to cover themselves, to replace the anointing that they lost, you know, but our righteousness is as filthy rags when it comes to the holy, holy God. And that's for who we're trying to align ourselves up with so that he knows us. He only knows those, praise the Lord, who aligns himself, themselves up with him. He didn't know the five foolish, you know, that's why it is a mistake for those in the secular society to think that, well, God, God loves everybody to the point where, you know, uh, he's uh, complicit to anything that they do. That's wrong. That's not Bible. The Bible doesn't say that. If God doesn't know uh, the five foolish virgins um, and they were left, they, the door was locked, then, then, then that's a precedence to tell us that God doesn't know anybody who doesn't follow him. If you don't follow him, he doesn't know you, you know? 
Of course, he's God and he knows everything that everybody does. But in terms of the personal relationship, in terms of, you know, having a oneness with him, you know, uh, you know, he's he doesn't see you like that. He doesn't know you like that. And, and so you want God to know you. And so uh, there's nothing that I can do. I can't erase the sin that I've done. But the only way that I can do that is by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only way that I can have my sins remitted. Somebody else took the stead for me. Somebody else got on that cross for me. Somebody else took the pain for me. Somebody else took the wrath of God for me because that's exactly what was happening when Jesus Christ was on that cross. Uh, he was feeling the wrath of God come upon him. And it was hard. You know, those who uh, were from the outside looking in just saw Jesus on the cross, you know. But, you know, if Paul is saying we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we're fighting against principalities and power, there are things that we fight that we can't see. Therefore, if we were, if we were to transport ourselves 2,000 years, over 2,000 years ago, and go to Golgotha's Hill and see Christ on the cross, we would see him on the cross. But then if we were to put on our spiritual spectacles, we will also see him fighting against principalities and powers. We would see him going, uh, fighting and, and, and resisting and trying to stand and trying to hang in there, not for himself, but for us. We would see him, uh, you know, just putting on uh, such a display of, of, of love, uh, you know, for all of us, uh, as he took the wrath of God upon himself. That's what was going on. Uh, he was taking a portion of the wrath of God upon himself, where the Lord was, um, um, you know, exercising his anger against sinners. And it should have been you. It should have been me on that cross that he exercised his anger towards, but the son said, I got this. And he took the brunt of all of, uh, of that anger, uh, the same type of anger that's going to be demonstrated unto those who, uh, who don't accept Christ. They don't accept Christ. They got to feel the brunt of the wrath of God upon themselves. But thanks be to Jesus Christ that we don't have to feel that because he did that for us. But we should say praise the Lord, because had he have not done that, then yes, we would exactly feel, we would we would feel that, that wrath come upon us hard. And so the only way that I can be, mortify my sin, first of all, I have to subject myself uh, to the will of the Lord to have my sins be mortified. That means I've got to be born again. I've got to go to Jesus. I've got to allow him uh, to transform me. I got to be born of the water. Uh, I've got to be born uh, of the spirit uh, in order to enter into uh, the kingdom of heaven, ultimately the kingdom of God, but then ultimately the kingdom of heaven. I have to, in order to have my sins, have a chance for my sins to be mortified because once Jesus comes on board and he, uh, he brings us uh, through, uh, praise the Lord, the water, uh, amen, that sanctifies us, uh, praise the Lord, um, and then he will, uh, you know, give us his Holy Ghost. Uh, now uh, he's given us, praise the Lord, um, uh, the means to be right. By going through the water of separation, as the Old Testament speaks about how, uh, praise the Lord, the, um, uh, the sacrifice uh, of the water, or rather the sacrifice was mingled with the water. Uh, it represents the water of separation and anybody that is sprinkled upon uh, praise the Lord, uh, has been, uh, you know, has received it, they are now considered uh, separate from, in a sense, separate from the world. And now they're, they're being made one with the Lord, being in right standard, this water of separation. And that's what our water baptism did. It separates us from the world. No longer are we the person that we were before we came into that watery grave. And so now that we're separate from the world, uh, our minds need to be changed, you know, and, and, and all of this, uh, praise the Lord, was typed and shadowed by the clean animals of old, where the Bible says that a clean animal is one who has split hooves and they chewed the cud. In other words, the split hooves represent the separation of the world. His feet is no longer walking with the feet of those who are in the world. Uh, he's walking, in a sense, spiritually speaking, down the narrow road that Christ paved and not the broad road that leads to destruction. But then it also speaks about how they chewed the cud. And the chewing the cud 
what that was was when you dealt with animals who would eat food and they would swallow it and regurgitate it and eat it some more, swallow, regurgitate it. So what we do spiritually is we take the word of God and we swallow it and then we think about it uh, and, and we swallow it. We regurgitate it by thinking about it some more and we swallow it and digest that. Then we go back and we think about it some more. So we're regurgitating it all over again. So you can see by looking at the clean animal illustration, praise the Lord, you are dealing with an individual who is separate from the world and who has a mind that thinks about Christ. And so uh, when Jesus is saying you had to be born again, yes, you have to go through the waters of separation, right? And then after you go through the waters of separation, you will receive the Holy Ghost. You have to, you will eventually receive the Holy Ghost. And with the, with the receiving of the Holy Ghost, you now receive the mind of Christ. So now you are considered a type of clean animal in whom God has cleansed, call not thou common nor unclean. So we are no longer com we are not common and we are not unclean because we have been born again. And now our sins have been remitted. Now, because of the work of Christ, I no longer have to deal with that, which was on me prior to coming to Christ. My sins have been mortified, but the nature of the flesh is still there. It's still there. And in order for that nature uh, to, uh, to be subjected unto the will of the Lord, you have to continue to do that which keeps it in the back corner which keeps it in the in 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 a dark room somewhere until uh praise the lord the lord then uh you know uh says that is enough i have seen enough but now i know you believe in god so all of these things that we're still enduring because of the nature of the flesh and you have it i have it everybody has it you can't deny it if you deny it then according to john you're calling it you're calling god a liar everybody has this and the, the thing is this, we just got to be able to, to show the Lord that we love him more than these. These things have been left here for us uh, to deal with, uh, praise the Lord, because it presents an opportunity for us to show God that we love him more than these. That's why the Bible says of the disciples, uh, you know, rejoice when you enter into temptation. It sounds it sounds weird to say that, praise the Lord, but yet when you think about it from their perspective, by me entering into temptation, I have an opportunity to show the Lord that I love him more than these. I have an opportunity to show all of creation that I love God more than these. And then I put myself in a good position. What have we seen? We saw Joshua uh, you know, resist his temptation because Satan was on his right hand as per Joshua, excuse me, Zechariah chapter three. And we saw the end of that temptation. He received uh, his linen garments. He received the symbolic robes of righteousness. We saw the end of Abraham's temptation when he was uh, commanded by the Lord to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice unto him. And the Lord waited until the very last second, just before that man was about to bring that knife down into that boy. Uh, he says, stop your hand. Why? Because now I know you believe in God. So the temptation, if it's done right, if we handle it the right way, if we look at it from the right perspective, it has the capacity to bring me to a place where I'm receiving my white robe, which represents righteousness. And I'm also receiving the title of righteousness, just as we saw with Abraham, uh, um, you know, once he once he obeyed God and the Lord said, that's enough. I, I'm convinced that you believe in God. He was known as the father of righteousness. So now we have the capacity because of temptation to be known and identified as children of Abraham. Those who were of Abraham ended up in paradise in the Old Testament times. Praise the Lord. That's where Jesus went down and, and preached unto the prisoners that were that were in hell on the other side of hell, uh, you know, not the tormented side that was separated by the bottomless pit, but we're talking about the paradise side. Just like he told the, the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. These were those that were in Abraham's bosom. In other words, these were those who died in faith as per what you read in Hebrews chapter 11. And so we will find ourselves, praise the Lord, uh, in that same type of company, of folks, we will find ourselves uh, coming before the great throne in the new and heavenly Jerusalem, you know, uh, the, in the, in the Mount Zion and 
amongst an innumerable company of angels, you know, amongst the spirits of just men made perfect, you see, by taking heed to the will of the Lord through all of our trials, through all of our temptations, demonstrate that we are the Israel of God. I say Israel of God, praise the Lord, because that name means a prince or a ruler, one who strives with God and man and prevails. So in other words, uh, when I'm going through a hard time and temptation is barreling down and breathing on my neck, uh, praise the Lord, <clears throat> but yet I don't give up, yet I don't throw in the towel, yet I don't curse God and die as, as, as Job's wife tried to get him to do, uh, yet I am not allowing uh, my so-called friends to convince me that I'm a sinner, uh, praise the Lord, because things don't seem to be going my way. You know, why am I allowed? And I refuse to open up my mind to these, these uh, uh, atrocious, uh, uh, you know, things to think about that they're trying to throw in my direction, these comments that they're making towards me. I refuse to give that up, uh, to, to allow that to, to get the best of me. Uh, and so by holding on to my integrity, I'm showing the Lord that I love him more than these, just like Job did. And uh, when we do that, then yes, uh, you know, we will be rewarded for it. And so uh, it behooves every last one of us to remain sober-minded. And how can you do that? Well, you have to think about those things that are from above. You have to think about those things that are holy, that are just, that are pure, that are honorable, that are of a good report as per what Philippians 4 teaches. These are the things that you have to meditate on. And why do I need to meditate on that? Why? Because these things will produce a particular set of fruit with inside of you. When we received the gift of the Holy Ghost, what we received was a seed of, of, of holiness. Now, every seed has to be nurtured in order for it to bring forth good fruit. And the type of fruit uh, that we are expected, uh, praise the Lord, to bring forth uh, as per uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. These are the things that will come about because we daily show the Lord that we love him more than these because we daily show him that we believe in God, that we daily, if, we, if we're daily showing him these things, then we are daily looking like the children of Abraham, daily. That's why he says, I've got to die daily. I, this flesh has to die daily. It means that if you killed it one day, you think that you suppressed it, uh, it's going to come back the next day. So just as you killed it yesterday, you're going to have to kill it today. And I'm not talking about the physical. I'm not talking about doing what the monks of old did. And they used to beat themselves with whips and, and all this. No, they had it all wrong. These, these folks uh, misinterpreted the word of God. We're talking spiritual. The only way you can mortify the flesh is not by a whip or anything that you used to beat yourself. Or, you know, you had, uh, you know, you, you had those like Martin Luther who would go out uh, and and put themselves and lay out in the cold and the, and the snow uh, just to uh, subject their flesh. That's what they thought they had to do. That's not what we're talking about. That's not how you subject and mortify the flesh. The only way you mortify the flesh is to think on these things: that which is holy, that which is just, that which is pure, that which is that which is of a good report. You have to look up to the hills from which come up your help. It's the Lord who suppresses all of these things. It's the Lord who, who continues to allow your mind to grow and to be, uh, you know, to resemble his mind, to have the mind of Christ. You know, you have to grow into these things. You know, even the, uh, Paul said, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen and understood by the things that are made, the things that I can see. I can understand the invisible by the things that, that I can see even his eternal power and Godhead, so that we're all without excuse, even the secular societies without excuse, because the invisible things of God are clearly seen by the visible. And so, you know, by knowing that, praise the Lord, I can now, uh, praise the Lord, know that, you know, whatever it is that, 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 that comes my way, 
Uh, praise the Lord. Um, as long as I continue to keep my mind stayed on him, then I will not falter. I will not fall. You know, uh, he will use these things, uh, praise the Lord, um, you know, to show me how it's supposed to be. In other words, if, if I was to look at a child uh, born into the world, uh, the child is a natural thing, you know, um, a natural person, you know, it's a visible thing that Paul is speaking about. But it, by looking at that visible thing, I can, I can learn something spiritual. I can learn of the invisible just by looking at the visible. So if I'm a child of God and I'm born into God, I'm not born a man into God, just the way that a, a baby's not born, uh, praise the Lord, as an adult. It's not born as an infant. And so spiritually speaking, if the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen and understood by the things that are made, I look at an infant and then I look at an infant child of God, I'm looking at two children. And so uh, as the natural infant needs milk and Similac and all of these other things to, to, uh, to nurture their bones, then I need to have milk and sp spiritual milk and spiritual Similac before I can be able to chew on some meat. I got to start off with the basics before I can go and have the hearty stuff. That's how it works. Before my, I have to make sure that my bones are mature and hardened in order for me to be able to chomp down on the meat of God. Even Jesus himself said, look, there are things that I have to tell you, but I can't tell you because you're not ready to receive them yet. Well, we ultimately should desire to uh, want to receive of those hearty things. Um, and that comes by spending time and meditating on the things of God. That's what it will do. Now, uh, temptation, according to the church, they delighted in the fact that they had an opportunity to demonstrate unto the Father that you know, they loved him more than these. But you gotta be careful because we're dealing with, it's like I was saying earlier, praise the Lord, we're dealing with a foe who is cunning and subtle and you know, he, he knows how to wield that that sword that he's carrying, um, yes, greater is he that is in us uh, than he that is in the world. But uh, you have to remember and you have to be careful. And this is what the, the, the apostles cautioned, you know, even us amongst themselves. They, they cautioned and say, hey, you need to take heed lest you fall. You know, they understood the importance of this fight and how, you know, you have to uh, position yourself so that you can be skilled for the battle. And if you're not positioning yourself to be skilled for the battle, uh, you could fall. And uh, I'm also reminiscent of the uh, parable of the seeds, that uh, there were some who fell by the wayside, some fell by the, on stony places, some fell on thorns, and some fell on the good ground. You know, the seeds are falling every day like manna comes down from heaven every day for the children of Israel in the wilderness, right? And you need to make sure that it's falling in a place where you can receive it. Um, it's not enough just to receive it, but you got to make sure that it falls in a good place, a place that is productive within your person, that it can nurture it from the inside and it will bud. It Rather, you will be able to, um, to, to suck all of the nutrients out of its shell, and then it will bud and then eventually bring forth the type of tree and fruit you're looking for. But you got to first make sure it falls on the good ground of your person, per, a part of your person that uh, will meditate upon it, a part of your person that cares about its well-being uh, to the point where you will you will cherish it like a like a hidden treasure that you found. The part where you will just hold on to it, you will never give it up, no matter what storms are coming your way, no matter what um, heathenistic words are coming your way, such as curse God and die. No matter if they're trying to, to, to convince you that you're a sinner through some type of gaslighting discussion and trying to make you see otherwise what is true, you know, just by you holding on because that seed fell on the good ground of your person will give you uh, the capacity to bring forth the type of fruit that God is looking for in which we had already read in Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23 of the fruits of the spirit. But if you don't do that and temptation comes because temptation is coming. It's coming and it's coming to ask your lust to come outside and play. If you have allowed the seed that God is freely given, uh, and that parable shows that God is freely giving these seeds, 
and his intention he and, and the lord has a has an aim you know he he can he can he can best any of the the pitchers on the mets on the yankees or wherever any of the ball players he can best them and i'm sure he made he tried to make sure that that seed was falling he pointed that seed to the good ground of your person your heart and if you turn the other way because you're looking to the left or you're looking to the right and you change his trajectory so that now the seed is falling here instead of falling here, then that's on you. If it falls by the wayside, the Bible says that the birds will come and pluck it away. And that represents the enemy will come and pluck it away. So he's around to see if he can find some seeds that were by the wayside. He wants to take that away because he knows what that seed's capacity um, can do for us, what it could potentially uh, give us. And he doesn't want that. He want, Remember, he's a murderer from the beginning. He wants to see us dead. And he knows that that seed is life. Get that thing out of there is what he's probably saying when he sees it, you know? And so he's looking to glean the seeds of God that he tried to plant inside of it. The Lord tried to plant inside of us. And so uh, if it falls on stony places, now this is on us. The first one was on the enemy where he'll come and try to take the seed away. But the next one is on us. If it falls on stony places and we don't meditate on it, right? Now the Bible says that the clean animals were clean. Why? Because they did the two things, not the one thing. You can't, he didn't consider them clean because they had one, because maybe they had split hooves, but they didn't chew the cud and vice versa. No, you have to have both. And so, yes, they had the word, it was in their person, but it wasn't on good ground. That meant that they didn't nurture it. They didn't meditate on it. They didn't think on it. They were just happy to just go to church and just say, I went to church. And because I went to church, I received the word, I'm good to go. But they walk out and don't think about anything that they heard. And so what's going to happen is it's going to wither because over time, uh, you know, the 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 sun and, the, and, and it's going to uh, beat down on it to, to the point where it's just not prosperous. You know, so it will wither and die eventually. Uh, it will stay in you and you'll come across that person and maybe they come to church only on, on Resurrection Sunday and they heard the word, but then you you see them a month later or two months later having, after having not seen them since then, you ask them about the service that they heard and the word that was given, they may not remember. You know, they didn't meditate on the word. And so that's on them. And the next thing that's on them is if the seed falls in thorny places if that seed falls on thorny places uh that means that the cares of this life have choked the word and so that's on them too and so uh there's one thing on satan where he's the one the bird that'll come and, and sweep the the uh the seed away that's gleaned by the wayside um and the other ones the other two are on man uh by not meditating on the word and by caring about the things of this world you know um, and so we have to be careful because temptation is coming. If you don't meditate on the word, that means you're going to meditate on something. Paul said that there was two laws, that uh, there was a law of uh, the spirit, which pertains to the law that was in his mind at the time, because he had the mind of Christ, right? He was born again. He felt that mind and that mind comes with the law. How do you know it comes with the law? Because the Bible even speaks about it in Isaiah, it speaks about how he's going to write the laws in our hearts. You know, it starts with the mind, it goes down to the heart, it becomes your character, you know, part of your soul. This is who you are, and you only speak what comes out of your out of your heart, you know. Um, and so that's why Jesus said that I myself can do nothing, but as I hear, that's how I judge. I can tell what's in your heart by what you say. And so, you know, it's important for us to make sure that, you know, we meditate and use the mind of Christ uh, daily. You have to, because if you don't, you're going to meditate on the other thing that Paul spoke about. I feel something worrying against the law of my mind, trying to bring me into subjection to itself. And that thing, which is trying to bring him into subjection unto itself, uh, will, um, is, is trying to, you know, um, push for the body of his death, um, to, to, you know, take up the, take the mantle, so to speak. And so, you know, whatever that law was, which we're going to say is the law of the flesh, is trying to bring him to death. And so if we don't occupy our minds with the laws of Christ, with the things of Christ, with that which is holy, Jesus said that these are the things of God. You know, um, this is the fullness of the law. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the laws and the prophets. If you walk in love, because that's what it's all about, 
then the love is the bible says of love it covers a multitude of sins that's what it will do and so it will mortify anything that's trying to bring you into sin love is what we need to have inside of us to combat um, the temptation that's going to come knocking on our doors uh asking if our lust can come out to play you know um and you know if we have been sitting around idle all the time and we've allowed lust to to uh, to form itself within us, then, you know, even though you may not be in sin yet, temptation is coming. And when it comes and presents itself and asks for your lust to come out to play, because that lust is inside of you, it's going to come out to play. It's going to be hard for it not to come out to play because you've done everything you could to nurture it, to come out and play, you know? Sin, excuse me, temptation only presents the arena for your lust to be showcased is what it is. Because prior to that, you know, you had the lust, but nobody knew you had the lust. Once you, once temptation came, it put the lust on display and then you showed yourself as a sinner. Reminded of praise the Lord, I believe it's in Proverbs 7, where it speaks about the young man who's walking down the street and he passes by this lady uh, who is married, but her husband was away and she's on the corner and she's looking for somebody to, um, you know, uh, uh, have a have a relations with, have a physical relations with. And so she lies and she tempts him and all of this just to get her into into her bed. And the Bible says that her bed leads to hell. Um, and so the only way that she was able to get to that guy was because his mind wasn't on Christ. He did not have the mind of Christ. He had the mind of the flesh. Because remember what we said that the works of flesh are these. And one of them is lasciviousness and, and fornication and adultery and all of these things. It's lust, you know. And if you are hard at work in the factory of your person, you know, trying to generate lust and, and build it up and, and you think nobody can see it, temptation is going to come around and it's going to call it out to play and you're going to give in. So the thing that we need to do is to do what Paul said. I feel something warring against the law of my mind, trying to bring me in subjection unto us. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And now he thanked the Lord God Almighty. He thanked Jesus Christ who has the capacity to deliver us from all temptations. He can lead us away from every temptation, you know, and temptation will have to flee. And behind every temptation is a demon. Yes, it is. Because when uh, Satan, uh, rather when Jesus went to be tempted an amount of temptation after he was baptized in the Jordan, praise the Lord, producing, uh, praise the Lord, the water separation for us to be baptized with later on, um, you know, uh, he goes to be tempted and uh, that temptation when it came to him uh, came in the form of Satan. And so every temptation has a demon behind it. And what's scary, praise the Lord, is that the Bible says in the last days, uh, many will fall um, and take heed and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know, uh, there will be many who will turn aside unto these things these seducing spirits, these spirits on the corner, like that woman, the harlot, you know, uh, who uh, is a daughter of the mother of harlots that we read in the Revelation account. Uh, and the mother of harlots is seen intoxicated by the blood of the saints. She has a particular palate. She doesn't want steak. She doesn't want, uh, you know, uh, filet mignon. She doesn't want, you know, Captain Crunch. She doesn't want any of that. She wants the blood of the saints. And so every harlot is after the blood of the saints. And so these seducing spirits are harlot spirits, and they're after the blood of the saints. They don't care about those who are not saints. She has a particular palate, and that particular palate wants the blood of the saints. She wants to kill, not just kill, murder saints. And she doesn't care how she does it. You know, she's complicit with Satan. She's complicit with the Antichrist. Why? Because when John sees her uh, in the Revelations account, uh, her name is, uh, you know, uh, Babylon, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, you know, and when John sees her, he sees her on a red scarlet beast, 
uh, you know, uh, having seven heads and 10 horns. The seven heads represents the fact that she's on all seven continents of the world. She's everywhere. You can go down your neighborhood and you'll find her on the corner. Oh, yes, she will. You know, and she's going to try to seduce you. And if all you've been doing that whole time is sitting around thinking about lust and, and all of the things that just generate uh, the lust of the flesh, she's going to call you out and you're going to give in. That's what you're going to do. And the Bible says if you give in, her bed leads down to hell. That's what it does. She just wants your blood. She's a vampire. This harlot is a vampire. And all she wants are the saints' blood. That's what she wants. And so in this instance, temptation, uh, you know, is bad. It is bad all around. I'm not saying it's a good thing at all. It's a joy for the saints who are prepared to fight against it. Why? Because it creates a platform uh, be in front of all of creation to show the Lord that you love him more than these. And there's a reward for that. There's a re so that's why this, the, the disciples, the apostles rejoiced when they fell into it. Why? Because it gave me an opportunity to show Jesus I love him more than these. And he's going to reward me for that. You know, he's going to call me righteous. He's going to see that I'm a child of Abraham. He's going to make sure that I'm in the choir loft, uh, ultimately, uh, on the Mount Zion, Zion uh, singing a song, the song of Moses, how he was delivered uh, from the hands of the enemy once he made it across to the, to the Red Sea. That Red Sea represented the baptism. It separated, praise the Lord, them from uh, Egypt, which was a representation of the world. Yes. And when you're on the other side of the separation, you sing the song of Moses. And so that's what we're positioning ourselves to do. And so these things remain because it gives us an opportunity to show the Lord that when we're weak, we're at our strongest. You know, my strength is made perfect through weakness. Paul, you're weak right now. You're weak. I know you're weak. You see, because that, 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 that agent of Satan is there buffeting you on your side. He's there on your right side. I'm sure it's the right side, likely just, just like it was with Joshua. Don't quote me, but I'm assuming that's that's how it is because the right side represents the side of power. And so he's trying to influence Paul. You know, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who he, he knows what Paul's work was all about. So he's going to stand on his right side and going to try to buffet him. Paul did the right thing. He didn't give in to the temptation because that's, that demon was on his right side tempting him. What do you think he was doing? He wasn't, he was tempting him. He was tempting him to try to think otherwise, to tempting him to no longer think holy, no longer think pure, no longer think just, no longer have a good report about stuff, just complain about everything. Never talk about anything good, never talk about anything just, just complain. I, I, and from his perspective, this is what the enemy was trying to do to Paul. He was trying to get him to the point where all he saw was negativity, you know, and all that does is breed, breed the flesh. That's what it does. It breeds worry. You start to sound and act like Adam after he fell, you know, and he uh, feared God and he just, everything was just distorted. And that's what happens when you don't have a good, when you don't think about the good report, praise the Lord. When you don't think about the testimonies, when you don't think about how God got you over. Remember, tribulation works patience. Patience works experience. Experience works hope. Hope maketh not ashamed. If you don't get, if you don't treat your tribulation the right way, by having faith in God, you'll never have patience. And if you don't ever have patience, then you won't ever have an experience because you'll never see God deliver you properly. You'll never understand how this is supposed to work. And if you don't have an experience, then you don't have hope in nothing that God is going to deliver you from the bigger things. Praise the Lord. Because he who is faithful over little will be faithful over much. So when much starts coming your way, all you're going to do is doubt God if you didn't walk through tribulation the right way. When that tribulation comes, it's coming with temptation. And when that temptation comes, it's coming with Satan. Yeah. Analyze it. You just looks at you, just sizing you up and down like a boxer. Somebody who studies your tapes before getting in the ring. Just watch and observe everything all about you. Looking for a weakness, looking for an end. And then once he sees it, he's going to exploit it. I see Jesus hungry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How can I somehow twist this to get him to doubt what God can do for him? Right now, he's in a situation. 
I got to get him so that he's not patient no more. I got to get him so that he won't, he, he won't wait on God to supply his needs. Why don't you go and turn that stone into bread? You're the son of God. You can do that. You know, or that's what Satan did was reveal what sons of God can do. Sons of God can call things into existence that just not there. You need bread? Well, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of a sudden you got bread. That can happen if we get into a certain place with God. And you may say, how do you know that happens? Well, Jesus was able to multiply fish and bread for the multitudes. A few he made much and had left over. Because why? This is what the sons of God can do. But he was trying to mess with his patience. So he will no longer wait on the father. Hey, you want it? You want this? Why wait on him? He may not come for another year. You don't know. He's creating scenarios. And if you sit there and listen to this temptation long enough, you just very well might believe it. That's why you have to read Job to see what this man did when he was in his temptation. He didn't know how long he was going to be suffering for. History records that he was suffering for about 13 months. That's what's recorded. In history, 13 months, that's a year and a month, a long time, and he refused to let go. The man daily would wake up and the routine was to take the, the pan and, and scrape his arm, scrape his legs, then watch the flakes fall off because of his skin diseases, all of that. And then to listen to the badgering and the negativity from his so-called friends. Looking them, looking down. That's why you got to be careful how you how you observe people. You might give people too much power. If you give them too much power, with a, to the point where you care about what they think, to the point where if if you're not making them happy, then 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 you know uh, you're not right. Forget that. Job said, "I'm not listening to you. I'm not going to follow you. You're like a bully. You're up there trying to tell tell his, his three friends. You're up there trying to convince me otherwise." that I'm some sort of sinner and that these things came on me because of something that I did wrong. But I know what my resume looks like. I, I understand what my pedigree is. And I know that I have the integrity that I had before is what I have today. I am not going to curse God and die. I have not stepped on his toes. I know I was right before him. I know he was my friend. Yes, he was. I understood him. I tasted and saw how God is good. And when I respond, when I when I corresponded with him and I interacted with him, I didn't feel any type of animosity. I didn't feel that he was looking at me a certain way, because even the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is going to let you know about some stuff. If you're a sinner, the Holy Ghost will make you aware that you're a sinner. The Bible says the Holy Ghost comes to convince the world, reprove the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. Of sin, because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father. Of, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Do you understand what this means? He's coming, the Bible says he's coming to reprove the world. That means he's coming to correct the world. That once Jesus did what he did, and he sends the Holy Ghost down here, so that he would give us the capacity to mortify our sins. Because when the Holy Ghost comes, he comes to change your heart. He comes to put his laws in your heart. He's the fulfillment of what was prophesied of old. And the Lord said, I'm going to send my laws. And I'm going to write it in your heart. When the Holy Ghost comes, he's coming with these three reproofs. And those three reproofs have under its umbrella the law of God. Love the Lord thy Lord God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That's what it has. And so he's coming to reprove, not just to chit chat, not just to, you know, just have barbershop conversation. No, I'm telling you, this is what it is. Oh, you judging me. Oh, you judge. No, you know why it sounds like I'm judging you? It's because the Holy Ghost inside me moves me to say this. Because even when Jeremiah said, I don't want to say no more, I don't want to do no more, because every time I do something and say something, I get in trouble. He was identified as a weeping prophet. Yes, he was. But then when he tried to keep his mouth shut, he says, I can't do it. It's like a, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. The Lord is moving you. It's like with, with Jonah, you can't run the other way. I said, go and speak to Nineveh. 
He sends the church out there. You can't run the other way. I sent you out into the uttermost part of the earth. So when they come and say, well, not everybody heard the word of God because there's some who are not in civilization. There's some who are way off in the in the boondocks, in the woods, and they how can they hear the word of God? My Bible says he will send the word to the uttermost part of the earth. That means somehow, some way, the wind is going to blow in their direction. And when the wind blows in their direction, he's going to reprove the world. He's going to reprove that civilization. He's going to reprove those people and that individual whom he speaks to at that time of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Forget the fact that you have multiple religions out there, false religions. The true religion is Jesus Christ, as per what James said, praise the Lord. But even though you got multiples out there in terms of the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Hare Krishna and the Mormons and the Catholics and all of them out there, Praise the Lord. You have them all out there, regardless of that. The Lord knows how to sift through stuff and get his wind to your ear. Praise the Lord to sit down with that person and show them what sin is, what righteousness is and what judgment is. And if that person doesn't receive it, then what that person is doing is blaspheming against the Lord. You say what? You don't believe me? You don't. You don't understand. You don't believe what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that this is sin. I'm telling you it's sin to not believe in the works of God. What is the work of God? To believe in the son. That's the work of God. So all you got to do is believe in the son. That's the work. Jesus said, it's not just, a, or rather James said, it's not just about doing, you know, having faith. Faith without works is dead. You got to believe it and put that in action. So Jesus said, how is it that you call me Lord, but don't do what I say? You believe me, but you're not doing what I said. I said, go get born again. You said, no, I don't need to do that. I, you did the work for me. Oh, really? I'm telling you, you need to mortify your sins. And all I see is your sin on display. I'm telling you what to do. You're like, I believe it was uh, Naaman who didn't want to go into the waters, uh, praise the Lord, uh, that Elijah instructed him to. Uh, to have his his leprosy, you know, removed and healed. I don't want to go in them dirty waters. I don't want to do that. You know who I am? I name it. I'm, I don't need to do that. And then when he just kept torturing him, he got the best of him. Finally, he said, I'm going to do it. And when he did it, he was delivered. You can believe all you want. You better start demonstrating your belief. You better start. And your demonstration of belief is your fruits. That's what demonstrates that you have fruit. A tree is not known, but except by its fruit. If, if not, it looks like an ordinary green tree. I don't know that it's a healthy tree except by its fruit. I can tell by the fruits. Praise the Lord. And so your works are your fruits. It shows that you are a healthy tree. Now you can look green all you want. That's why Jesus cursed the fig tree when it didn't have fruits. Oh, you look healthy, but you don't have fruit in your season and you're supposed to. No, there is no excuse. When the Holy Ghost is coming, he's coming hard. Oh, yes, he is. He's coming to reprove and correct. That's why if you're a preacher, if you're a teacher, forget all of that. If you're a Christian and a door of utterance is opened up in front of you to say X, Y, and Z about Jesus Christ, don't you hinder the Holy Ghost. Don't you quench the Holy Ghost. You better open your mouth and cry aloud and say, what doth say of the Lord? He's coming to reprove. And if it sounds like judgment, I mean, you use discretion. Of course, you're trying to win souls. And of course, you have to draw them in with love and kindness. Absolutely. But that reproving portion of it tells me that you shouldn't be ashamed to say what needs to be said. you got to say this thing. And then you got to back it up. You got to back up what you're talking about because they're going to ask you questions. And so you have to be able to have an answer for the, for the life that you live in Christ. That's why you have to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word, rightly dividing the word. The word of truth is divided. You'll, hear, you'll come across somebody who's, who's, who's a master uh, at the word, praise the Lord, because of their experience with God. You come across Paul, 
And Paul, you sit at you sit down to him and you try to rather no, 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 look at Paul. Let's look at Jesus, a master at his word. And they tried to they tried to trick him up. But he was able to come at them to the point where he left them walking around, feeling like he left, he, he let them going back away from him, saying such things. I never heard a man speak like that man. And they were too afraid to come and come against him again. You don't think we can do that too? He said we can do that. He said, with the things that I do, you'll be able to do more so because I go to the Father. Temptation's going to come. It's going to come. You have to be ready. And if you're ready, you're ready. Why? First of all, the Lord is not going to put us in a situation that we can't handle. Temptation is not going to come until the Lord knows we are ready. And we should be ready. What it does is it provides a, it shines a spotlight on who we are. That's what it does. If you're ready, you'll resist the temptation. You'll meditate on the word. Look at what Jesus did on the Mount of Temptation. He combated temptation by the word. He didn't bring his own logic and reasoning and things like that to the table. You can't do that. You have to unlearn what you have learned and only learn the things of God. And so he only used the word of God uh, to combat the temptation like a sword. Master just wielded, wielded to the point where Satan had to flee. Submit unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee. That's what the Bible says. And we can do that very same thing. Oh, yes, we can. He's given us his word. That means he's given us his sword. You're not just supposed to hold the sword in vain. You're supposed to use the sword. Yes, you are. You're supposed to use it like he used it. If somebody steps out of line, don't be afraid to knock them back in line. What did Jesus say to Peter? The devil's speaking through you, Peter. Yes, he is. What did Paul say to Peter, uh, an apostle who was an elder apostle to him? And he rebuked him. Peter understood he was right and he was coming from the right place and fell back in line. At times, it's going to take that, respectfully, of course. Why? Because you care about your brother. You are your brother's keeper. And they have to do the same for you. Why? Because we're not perfect. We're going to mess up. We're going to trip. We're going to do all of these things. But our intent, praise the Lord, is not to stay in those things. Our intent was never to fall. That's why John said that the saints don't sin, or rather, they don't practice sin. They don't think to sin because they don't have the mind of flesh any longer. They don't have that. They have the mind of Christ. And as long as they have the mind of Christ, and as long as you're in this body, that mind is going to be uh, fought against on a daily basis. That's why you have to die daily. You have to put that, you have to wake up and get, get your boxing gloves on, your spiritual boxing gloves on, and fight your flesh. You have to nurture the spirit, the mind of Christ inside of you. And how do you do that? You pray, you read. You separate yourself through fasting and all of that because some things don't come out but by fasting and prayer. Now, praying is interesting. And I want to highlight that because Jesus said to the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane that if you don't pray, you will enter into temptation. Yes, you will. So with prayer, there's something potent that comes with prayer. When the Lord is, uh, sees a saint in sincere prayer, he gives them something. He extracts other things. He prunes the leaves from our limbs, gets the dead stuff off so that the dead stuff doesn't become a cancer to the good stuff. He removes these things. And if you are daily in prayer, just imagine this. And he's been pruning you every time you get on your knees and you, you direct your mind's attention to him and you cry out unto him, praise the Lord. When you do that, he's pruning you. What are you... All you have left is a fuller, fuller tree with green leaves and beautiful fruit. You are going to be stronger than you were five prayers ago, 10 prayers ago. Imagine. And then when temptation comes, you will be in a position to glorify God because you'll look at the temptation as a as a as the door to show God you love him more than these. You're putting yourself in a position to receive your white robe, to receive the, the accolades from God, the title of being righteous like Abraham was, to be Abraham's seed, to be the Israel of God, 
to be the one who strives with God in everything that he directs us unto and showing the patience of God in that situation. And you strive against man by showing our patience towards them because the Bible says we have to love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So when you love him, you're going to strive with him. You're going to walk with him. You're going to um, not put up with it, what, what, what he has, but rather you're going to um, be submissive to his will. When you strive against man, you are patient with men. You are, um, you know, as if you're trying to uh, win a soul unto Christ. You're not complicit with what they think and how they behave. You, you can't be that. Because if you are that, then you're no different than Lot's wife. Yeah, she left the city. Yeah. If you looked at it from the helicopter all the way down, if you if you were a reporter uh, reporting on the, the demise of Sodom and Gomorrah and you see way over there heading towards the mountains, Lot, his two daughters and his wife, yeah, you would think, oh, well, they, they made it. They made it. But that woman didn't make it. Why? Because her heart was in the city. So you can't allow yourself to be complicit with the sins of the well. And they're trying, saints. They're trying to make sure that we're complicit with this tolerance and this liberality and, and all of these things. No, no, you are never to love any type of sin. Never. And they're behaving like Job's friends by ostracizing us and laughing in a sense at us, mocking us in a sense by saying, you know, uh, you know, we're on the wrong side of things. They're on the right side and we're on the wrong side. They have the nerve to say, praise the Lord, that they are on the side of love. You cannot have love unless you have Jesus. You don't. You don't have true love, not the love that the Lord is looking for in us. You have a semblance of it, just like you have a semblance of life. Even though you're in a secular society, you have a semblance of life because you have breath in you. That's a semblance of life, of a, a taste of what you can have in, in Jesus. And you have a semblance of love because you love your, your family and things like that. But that's not the true love. You don't want a semblance. You want the true. And so the only way to get the true love is by receiving the God of love, because the Bible said that God is love. The only way you get that is through receiving Jesus Christ, being born again, allowing his spirit to come inside of you. And when he comes inside of you, he's coming in, praise the Lord, to clean out and cast out the money changers. That's why you get the Holy Ghost. You start speaking in other tongues right away as the spirit of God gives the utterance because he's busy casting out the money changer. I'm starting with you. I'm going to make you holy. That's what that's his objective. He's not waiting until next week to start speaking in other tongues of the Spirit of God give the other. He starts right away to speak in other tongues of the Spirit of God give the others. Why? What does that do? It, it's a blessing unto your soul, is what it is. Paul speaks about that. You know, how it's a benefit to you spiritually when you speak in other tongues. It's not a benefit to anybody who hears it. Oh, they're happy you, you got saved, but this is an internal benefit for me. It benefits my soul. It's a, there's a language that's going on between me and my friend. He knows me. It's a sign that he knows me because he's communicating with me. Those five foolish virgins, he didn't know. He wasn't communicating with them. Therefore, they wasn't speaking in, in the in unknown tongues of the spirit of God give the utterance. No, they was not. But when he comes, he's going to cast out the money changers with the same type of tenacity that he showed when he entered into Jerusalem and cast those out, those folks out of the temple. Get out of here. Get out of here. My father's house will be known as a house of prayer. It will no longer be a den of thieves. And when we stood in our filthy robes and filthy garments, we were a den of thieves. But when Jesus comes in here, he's going to cast out the money changers. And all of a sudden, they're gone. And now our house is now a house of prayer like it's supposed to be. And if it's a house of prayer, you better get to praying. Praise the Lord. Why? Because the praying is going to keep you from temptation, from entering into. Not You're going to go into temptation. Jesus was led into temptation, but he didn't give into temptation. That's the difference. 
And so you won't give into temptation if you are praying because the Lord is going to give you the wherewithal. He's going to keep your minds. If you keep your mind stayed on him, it means you got to do a part in this. You can't, can't sit back and just let Lord do everything. You got to meditate on him. And as you're meditating on him, praise the Lord, demonstrating that you're like one of the clean animals of old by being separate from the world and meditating on the things of God, he is going to feed you. Why? Because he's the good shepherd, knowing that we are the sheep. We can't feed ourselves. But as the good shepherd feeds the sheep, he's going to bring us by the green pastures and the still waters. He said, I am the living water. I will give you this living water so that you can live forever. It will clean and cleanse your insides, your minds, and all that gunk that was a part of your person that made you a den of thieves. It will no longer look like that. You will be whole holy as I am holy in heaven. So the temptation's coming, but you better be prepared. Don't meditate on the flesh because that won't prepare you for the temptation. That will suck you in and you will fall into it. And in every temptation is the gates of hell and you will fall, you fall into that. And if you continue to, to cultivate the flesh, you're going to walk, you're now going to be complicit with the mindset of the gates of hell. Now you're going to come against the saints trying to get the blood of the saints. No, can't be a harlot with hell. Absolutely not. No, you can't lay in the same bed with hell. Absolutely not. You can't do that. We need to do this right. Let the Lord lead us. Let the Lord guide us into all truth. And in doing so, praise the Lord, he will give us the capacity to have that mind of Christ that when the temptation comes, it's not going to be, uh, you know, the end of the world for us, but rather an opportunity for us to step up higher, that rung, go up the rung of the ladder of Jacob higher until ultimately we're on the top of the ladder with the Lord singing a song, the song of deliverance, the song about how I got over, the song of Moses. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. We do thank the Lord. Amen. For blessing us. Amen. With the opportunity to uh, break the bread of life. Uh, amen. And um, um, there's still a lot more to say, uh, you know, but this is, you know, what was said for now. Um, but I would uh, praise the Lord, um, you know, just think about, you know, the importance of mortifying sin, the importance of uh, temptation coming, it's coming, and being prepared for it. And uh, the importance of making the right choice in the preparation for temptation by our preparation will, will, uh, you know, convince the Lord that we love him more than these. My strength is made perfect through weakness. When you're at your weakest and yet you can still say Jesus, you know, that glorifies God. You know, you don't want to be in your flesh and the temptation comes and you give in. How is that glorifying God? It's not, it, it really isn't, you know, the Holy Ghost has come to reprove the world. And, you know, he's going to speak to everybody and convince everybody of what righteousness is and what con and what judgment is and what sin is. And if we say no to that, then, you know, we're saying no to the Holy Ghost. And, you know, uh, the blaspheming against the Holy Ghost, especially is when somebody who knew God and now walked away from God said no. Um, but those, praise the Lord, who um, who did not know God, but yet resisted the Holy Ghost, um, you know, the Lord is uh, continually showing patience for to the point where ultimately he says, okay, that's not that's enough. And he gives them a reprobate mind. Then technically, yes, they have now blasphemed the Holy Ghost because they said no to the Holy Ghost. Uh, no matter what the Holy Ghost said, they said no. They said that's not righteousness. That's not sin and that's not condemnation. That's not judgment. But yes, it is, you know. And so ultimately, uh, a person who ends up blaspheming the, Holy, blaspheming the Holy Ghost is somebody who says no to the Holy Ghost. Whether it's the church who is with the Holy Ghost and leaves like those, there will be a great falling away from the faith. Or whether those who are in the secular society who the Holy Ghost has gone out to the uttermost parts of the world and convinced and, and reproved them of what the true sin is and the true righteousness is and the true judgment is. And ultimately, after God has had his hands stretched out still, um, you know, and they refuse to take it. And yeah, a reprobate mind uh, is the uh, um, equals uh, blaspheming the Holy Ghost. You you said no. And uh, you, you missed the rapture for those things. And so 
we this is a very serious thing and we need to make sure that we are on the right side of things so i do thank the lord for the opportunity amen and if there are any questions before we close questions or comments amen i'd like to open up the floor uh praise the lord for anybody who has a question or comment in jesus name Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well done, my son. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. You uh, brought it forth that good to where you is, is all there. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So again, we want to thank everybody uh, who joined us this evening. Amen, Elder Bess. I don't think he's here. He he texted me that he may not be here, mm -hmm. so I don't think he was able to get back. Uh, praise the Lord. Normally, I would um, I would turn the floor with him for closing out. Amen. He did want to be here, but he had a prior event that he couldn't miss. Uh, it was a family event he couldn't miss. Uh, amen. So, um, uh, with that being said, I do want to invite uh, everybody to come back for our next encouragement series session, which will take place. Uh, next week, um, next week, Thursday, June 29th, our instructor will be uh, Elder Mark Brantley. Amen. So we uh, we do invite you to come on back out um, next week and join us again for the next Encouragement Series session. And without further ado, um, let us go before the Lord and close out in prayer. In his name. Amen. Let every, let every heart pray. Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we love and thank you. We're asking, Lord, that you will continue to speak to our hearts, that you will continue, Lord God, to lead us and guide us into all truth, that you will continue to feed us your words and your ways. We know how important that is because your words, Lord God, uh, is the weapon uh, by which, praise the Lord, uh, we can combat the enemy. And uh, we so we need to, uh, your words to fall within the good ground of our person to be productive within us so that you would see from your heavenly throne, uh, Lord God, looking down upon us, that our boughs are green with wonderful green leaves and they're thick and they're heavy with uh, fruits of the spirit. So Lord, we're asking for that. Bless every whole household represented here. Look upon us all. Bless those that were here, had to leave. Bless those who wanted to come, but couldn't come. Bless the whole church. Uh, please honor the prayer requests and keep us rapture ready and away from the enemy, of course. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen and amen. Amen, amen. Amen. Love you, everybody. Love you all. Thank you. Amen. Have a blessed evening, everyone. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you all. Amen. Bless you, Elder Bonet. God bless. Beautiful lesson. Bless you. God bless you. Bless you, everyone. Amen. amen. God bless Have you. a blessed evening. God bless. Take care. Yes, sir. God bless you. Amen. Uh, thank you, uh, Sister Lynch. Thank you so much uh, for taking over uh, hosting duties. God bless you, Elder Brene. No problem at all. <laughs> Thanks. I think you have to stop the recording uh, before we close out uh, in Jesus' name. But thank you so much. <laughs>